Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. Vanessa Oswald is going to be our guest tonight on the Barbarian Hour. First things first, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I've been trying to get this uh, connected with you. Uh, we talked last spring. We, par- like, we talked last year right when I started the show. We wanted to have you on. And I remember, obviously, I was talking to uh, Coach Don DeSabato last week. You're the first, like, kind of badass I saw that was uh, out wrestling in boys' meets, and I brought up the weight tournament, right? Do you remember what I'm talking about, the Toledo weight tournament? I do. I remember Toledo weight. It's like this old school. Old and school. You drive like, up it's like in a the fortress. Of- <laughs> looks like a fortress, right? Yes, it's like an old vintage school. It was my favorite tournament to wrestle in, even though, you know, didn't have too many wins there, but I still got a few. <laughs> so I remember it was a Friday night and you either chin whipped a guy or lat dropped him. And lat picked- dropped probably. It was awesome. Cause like you said, you wrestled up a weight a lot of the time, didn't you? Yeah, I, I kind of refused to cut weight and because um, I was so focused on postseason wrestling with the girls that I was like, I'm not going to cut weight during season and make this whole year miserable. So I just wrestled where I was and um, yeah, I wrestled 125 and then 130, 135 and 140 my senior year. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. And, not, and cutting weight wasn't your thing. But so, you know, just to continue the introduction of you. You're, you're a senior level athlete. You wrestled in the world class athlete program for the United States Army. Is that correct? Yes, yes, I did. Back in uh, 2010 is when I joined the Army. Um, actually, 2009, started wrestling with them in 2010. And then um, I walked away in 2012. Okay. So you wrestled at the senior level. I mean, I remember you because you went to Mount Vernon, right? Mount Vernon High School. Yes. Are they the yellow jackets? What are they? Gotta help me. They're the yellow jackets in orange and black. Okay. Yeah. I was just gonna say where okay. So Perrysburg <laughs> is the yellow jackets, right? But they're black and they're they're yellow, which kind of makes sense for a yellow jacket because it's kind of what the it does. Are. It does. Listen, this was before <laughs> my time. <laughs> so are you an 04 or 05 grad of high school? 05. 05, okay. Because then I remember you out in Fargo. Yep, I wrestled okay. out in Fargo. I think we rode in the van together, and I probably made you laugh for a while. Yes, yes. I was probably pulling people's hair out, too. Like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, But it's crazy to think that, you know, you're one of the pioneers in, in the sport of wrestling, especially girls wrestling, and you've done it at all the levels is what's crazy about it, right? You've done it as a competitor in high school, then as a senior level, and now you're coming back and you're giving back, and you're the co-head coach at Olentangy Orange. Did I get the right Olentangy? You did. I know there's like five of them out there. Berlin, right? Orange, Liberty. There's original like Olentangy Braves. Is yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I think you got them all. I think I got them all. I mean, and it mm-hmm. just keeps growing, right? Like it keeps I know, growing. I know. More to come. <laughs> well, there's probably, yeah, probably more to come. And um, mm-hmm. cause Jaggers, Jay Jaggers told me he lives in Olentangy Braves, like his kid right now would uh, go to oh. Olentangy Braves. So, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's like right down the road, like a mile. <laughs> that's so crazy that it's all like right there. Um, so you do not live super close. You travel a little bit, right? Oh my gosh, do I travel? Yes. Yeah. So I live in Mount Vernon, and then I work in Mansfield, which is forty-five minutes north, and then I drive an hour south to Columbus 
to coach and then an hour back home to Mount Vernon. Oh my God. That's, is that, how many days a week is that? Um, I'm at Old Tangy Orange coaching at least three to four times a week. And you're the co-head coach with Brian Nicola. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And who is the head boys coach at Orange? Uh, Scott Tressler. Okay. Because they were just, I want to say Orange was just up at that Mommy Bay class. Mommy, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah, yep. they had a guy in the finals that wrestled. He did that. 150 pounder. Pretty tough. Yep. yep. I mean, yeah, so they're doing the things right there. And it's obviously, it's, it's something where they're, they're growing exponentially, exponentially in all those districts. Obviously, Dublin had kind of a similar growth. Um, Hilliard, all the, you know, the 270 loop around Columbus had that, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And we're right there. I mean, um, basically we're on the outskirts of Columbus and then right north of us is farmland, but it's just like getting so populated. Houses are uh, popping up everywhere. It's crazy. Total explosion. I mean, it has been unbelievable to see the Columbus area grow because I'm in Northeast Ohio and, you know, Cleveland was the king forever as far as population and metro area, but man, Columbus is just it is exploding. And then obviously you have the people who love Ohio state who, you know, a lot of those people don't leave. They move in the, the, the suburb around, around there, but okay. Give me your journey real quick from Oh, Oh four, Oh five. You graduate from Mount Vernon high school, right? Yes. Yes. What did you so do directly I, after? Okay. So I um, graduated from actually let's kick it back to 2004. 2004 is kind of what put me, I guess, more so on the map. I qualified for the Olympic team trials, the first um, Olympic team trials for women. Um, the first Olympics was in 04. So I qualified for that, wrestled in that, um, went out to the Olympic training center in the summer, did a training camp. And then um, that following summer is when I graduated and went out to Fargo, won Fargo. I turned around and my dad and I came back because my mom was deployed at the time. And we came back, packed up all my stuff and went on a flight out to Colorado. And I moved out to Colorado and trained at the Olympic Training Center. Um, I was there for four years, joined the Army and then wrestled for the Army World Class Athlete Program. In 2009, I was number two in the country um, making the national team. How many national teams did you have the opportunity to be on it? It was like double digits almost, right? Cause you were, when did you retire from competitive? I retired in 2012. Um, I actually only made the one national team. I was fourth and I was fourth a few times, but yeah, only making it once actually. First off, it's really hard to do. I don't think a lot of people get how hard it is to be a U.S. national team team member. And the top three qualify as U.S. national team members. They can get a monthly stipend. They do a lot of the training camps that are offered to you guys. Um, obviously, you can wrestle overseas, and you have a lot of opportunities to wrestle overseas, simulations. And then the other thing with that is being the number two, you're the alternate, essentially, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty difficult um, when I had made the national team in 2009. Um, you really don't like back then you really didn't make that much money and still you didn't make that much money unless you have sponsorships, which wasn't big back then. And then, um, winning world medals. So you're really not making that much money. So making the um, national team, you only got a stipend back then. It was, um, I think for like six months. So that's when I decided to join the army in 2009 and went through um, boot camp and did my uh, career field school and then came back in 2010. And then that's when I started really um, kicking up in training and it came back and I was in the middle of a training camp and got injured and then just kind of um, needed surgery on my hip and prolonged that surgery. And so I was done in 2012. Did you do any extra damage to your hip? Did you do, did you overcompensate? Did you, did you have like extra lingering stuff that kind of stuck with that? Yeah. So I ended up um, tearing the labrum in my hip and then the other one tore in my hip. And then in 2012, I had the surgery or was it 13? I had surgery in 2013 and um, six months later it retore. So, well, I'm not getting so, another so surgery. Wait, have you torn both then? Both hips? Yeah, they're both torn. Mm-hmm. Not now though. Have you, are they both repaired? No, no. Vanessa, what's wrong with you? You're a maniac. 
you gotta get that fixed. Yeah, it just I'm like if it retour in six months, it's just that's just how it's gonna be then. So you're living with it. How is your pain? Can you sleep? How is all that? Um, running is, is not so great. And then kind of like getting in those scramble situations where, um, cause I'm pretty flexible. And so getting my, um, I don't know, legs kind of like stretched out. It doesn't feel great. Um, but you live with it. Oh my God. I can tell you this, my kid, my four-year-old knew how to do a drop step last year. And then all of a sudden he doesn't know how to do a drop step. Cause he's just a goofball. Right. <laughs> And I was like, dude, you, how do you forget the drop step? And then the, the head coach was like, worked on him for a couple of minutes. Um, and that, he was like, yeah, you should, you should show him a drop step. I go, I, I don't know if I can do a drop step right now. Like my, my right <laughs> knee might explode. Cause when you pound right. me over toe, right? Like that, like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm 42, I'm 250, probably 255 pounds right now. That's hard, right? Like that's yeah. not easy. Oh yeah. I don't think people get, and you're substantially younger, lighter, way better looking than I am. And, you know, because the ugly hurts you too, just so you know when it's me. But, like, <laughs> it, it, is, it is not easy. When you get older, like last year I wrestled with some big guys, you know, some 280-pounders, 290s, 300s, and just moving them and pulling on them. And you get so tired so quick, right? I can't imagine my hips just blowing out. I can't imagine that. And that's effectively yeah. what will happen to you if, like, you, you continue to neglect it. You do get that, right? Oh, yeah. They told me that the next thing will be a hip replacement. <laughs> Let me make it to 40 before I get a hip replacement. Oh, my God. Yeah, see, I'm 42, <laughs> and I haven't had to get the knee yet. But it's common because I blew it out really had, bad in high school. I had surgery on my feet, and so um, on both of my feet. And so, like, right now to do, like, a drop step, like, to go over top of your toe, like, mine doesn't really bend. And so, like, I catch myself all the time. You, like, it can fall? be difficult. Yeah. Go to a little kid do a drop step. She can't do a drop step. Kids like, making fun of you. Yeah. yeah. How are you going to show us how to do it when you can't even do it? Yeah, I mean, that's – yeah, but, like, I was, like, just on the mat, and I was, like, yeah, I can probably do a drop step. It's just going to hurt real bad tomorrow. I just thought about it. You know, you make trade-offs. You know. Uh, so you're the assistant, or I'm sorry, the co-head coach for Olentangy Orange with Brian Nicole. You're the co-head coaches together. Obviously, you're building a monster. I love my guy Rob Gore is constantly in your room, all constantly working around you guys because he lives. He around, is amazing. Right? Yeah, yes, great guy. yes, yes, yes. One of our greatest supporters. Like every time I see him, I just have to beeline it to him and just um, thank him. And same with uh, inside the circle those guys are oh just God. amazing they it's give the girls so much support they don't have to but they do they kill it and then I look like a total jerk when I don't go to the girl stuff because I'm going to my nephew stuff or my kid stuff everyone's like well why aren't you at the girl state chip George Shore George Shore holds my feet to the fire I like that he's like why, why aren't you at our stuff and I'm like I, I got go, I got nephew I got the kid uh, I can't miss their stuff and which you're probably like, yeah, it's a great excuse but the moment I do get a free moment and I can go to one of those, I'm going to go to it. I'm going to go to it. Obviously, the OHSA state tournament, that's like the big motivation for having you on is you're sanctioned, right? You're yeah, sanctioned. Uh, next year. You, next year, we will have a tournament. Obviously, not this year. But we could have, you know, another groundbreaking year. Like last year, we had Olivia Shore was the first state placer in OHSAA boys state championship history at 106 pounds. She took sixth place. I videoed all the matches. Love the old man. I love his crazy outfits. Um, I Olivia like is amazing. She's just a phenomenal athlete. She's a killer. Mm -hmm. She's a killer. She's a big move. Per they're the, all the shores are. All the shores are inside trippers. They're they'll chin whip you. They'll headlock you. They'll they'll do a lat drop, an arm spin. They do all this crazy stuff, but they go hard and they go for broke. And I, I appreciate that about them. I like that. Oh, she grinds. I have mad respect for her. She just grinds and she hangs in there. And, um, she, you know, she's one of the best females to come out of Ohio. Yeah. She is at Tiffin now, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did you ever wrestle in college? Did you ever do any NAIA, anything in college? No, no. So um, there was only, I think, six colleges when I was coming up. And so um, I was looking to go to Northern Michigan. They had the Olympic education center up there 
And that's my intent was to go there. And then Terry Siner, um, who is the national women's team coach, had called and said that they were looking to get um, a group of young girls out there and uh, asked if I wanted to move out there and train. So that's a route I took. It's not doing so bad. It's not doing so bad. He He's kind of built a really good thing out there, I think, right? Would you agree with that? Oh, heck yeah. So back when – um, when I had talked to him, they, his wife and um, Terry would always have the girls over. And I didn't realize that when he first took that position back in what um, the nineties or early, I think it was the nineties, they were only, they had only offered them 50,000 or 55,000, something like that. How crazy is that? He's getting the job done. His results are yeah. incredible. Obviously at the world championships, um, obviously the last, uh, Two Olympics, you know, we we obviously broke 2016. Holland Marulis obviously broke broke it broke the uh, the barrier for the United States of America, right? She was our first um, gold medalist in the gold. United, mm-hmm. in the Olympics, right? 2016 Correct. Rio, and then um, uh, Tamara stock. unbelievable, unbelievable Olympics for her. Um, I was super stoked about it, and um, I think she was she runner up or bronze at the Worlds. I forget. Who, uh, Tamara, she was, she took this Bron- past year or? Yeah, Bron- no, this, cause they had a, they had an Olympics and then they had a world championships. I know she's a world champion. Oh, I understand that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cause her and David yeah, Taylor, I, I want to say were, she got beat early on, didn't she? She did. Yeah. So she, but here's my thing with her and David Taylor. I'll take the Olympic gold medal. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm all sat with an Olympic gold medal over a world championship in the same year. It was like, kind of like wasn't even like the, you know, it wasn't as tough as the Olympics was. And a lot of guys didn't show up from Russia and a lot of the, the Japanese number ones for the women's didn't show up. So it was like, eh, you know, I could take it or leave it. But if I'm her, if I'm David Taylor, I'll take my gold medal. Would you agree? Yeah, I would. I'll take the Olympic gold. I'm just a huge fan. Let's just listen. Tamara Mets of stock. I was so fired up at the Olympics. This year. She's a killer. Oh my gosh. She is such a, um, sweet individual as well. Um, I got to meet her and uh, be around her. She's one of the most down to earth people I've ever met. Yeah, she's awesome. She does a lot of, uh, media stuff. She's been doing a lot of media tours and stuff like that. So I get to see her in interviews and she's always been easy to deal with when we have to talk to her or anything like that for interviews. So she's mm-hmm. awesome to deal with. Um, Adeline Gray, the arguably the greatest, the, goat. the, the greatest, right. Um, mm-hmm. six time world champion. Um, Olympic uh, silver medalist to uh, German Roder Roderfacken, right? Is that right? That's right. I don't know these that, names. That feels right. That feels right. Come on. Yes, that's who it was. A person who she had previously never lost to, I believe. So sometimes people just get up. She, I wrestled. I wrestled her a few times, and um, when I would wrestle against her, it was like grabbing a hold of a brick wall. Yeah, she she's unbelievable, and Adeline, right? Adeline has just been her mm-hmm. level has been so high for so long, and then you know, 2016 she had a disappointing uh, Rio Olympics, and then she bounces back for a medal. What do you foresee for someone who has such a long, long career with a high level of success? Do you see her like coming back for another quad, or what does she do moving forward? Um, you know, that's on her. Uh, everyone's got to figure out where they're at mentally and physically because sometimes, you know, physically you're still in it, but mentally you're not, or mentally you are and physically you're not. So, um, I think she just weigh out these next couple of years and see where she lies and, um, see if her heart's still in it. I mean, she's still training like a beast. So <laughs> when I don't think your, that ever goes away. Yeah. When did your body start to like, when did the hip injuries start happening? And when did you really start to feel the wear and tear of like the senior level circuit and wrestling at such a high level? When did the injury start to really occur for you? Oh, um, pretty much right when I moved out to Colorado. Um, it was um, when I wrestled against the boys, they were just so brutal to me. And, um, you know, back when actually it was at Toledo weight, um, my coach, John Brown, who has since passed away. Right. Um, he, pulled my parents to the side and he told my parents, uh, to pull me out of the match because 
they, he said, I see these guys aren't trying to wrestle her. They're, they're trying to hurt her. So, um, it was like every tournament, the guys were trying to like crank on my arm or crank on my shoulder. And I moved out to, um, when was it? It was right before, right at the, towards the end of the season, I tore the ligaments in my elbow, the honor collateral ligament. And so then when I moved out to Colorado, it just got worse. And so then I ended up having surgery on that one. I was coming back from that surgery and I posted my arm and a girl fell into my arm in the middle of live goes, um, tore those ligaments. And then in the middle of coming back from that one, I retoured the ligaments, in my other elbow. So it was just like, <laughs> It was just one right after another. So both elbows, mm -hmm. feet, both hips. Oh, don't even get me started on my neck. I How's have, the knees? Uh, How are the knees? The knees are good. The knees are good. The knees and shoulders are good. But listen, I just got to give you some credit. You're telling me all these like injuries. The thing you got going for you is your face didn't get beat up. <laughs> face didn't get beat up and I can see that you're, how are your ears? My ears are beautiful. I have beautiful ears. Yeah. They're not cauliflower <laughs> at all. So that, so listen, no, they're you've flexible. dodged that bullet. You've dodged that bullet, but like, it sounds like. The one thing I wanted was cauliflower ears. No, <laughs> no. I told somebody the other day, I'm like, listen, you don't want cauliflower ears. My, Cause my ear, like it, you know that it messes up how, you know, naturally your ear channels sound into your eardrum right you know that yeah right? it's a thing. yeah we're designed if, if you didn't know that so it's like i can't hear i cannot hear and it's because when your ears get cauliflower it it messes up the design nature's design to ch channel the sound into your ear so trust me you're good you're all good on that right you're good Tr i promise you're good so okay so the injury started early on Right, because you wrestled so oh, hard, yeah. it, it, it was like it carried over from the end of high school to when you started. Well, you're doing like two a days, and you're just going full throttle um, through training constantly. And then you know you go into training camps, and it's three a days, and really you only get a break at maybe uh, Christmas. We got a week or two off, but then that's like in the height of our training, so you got to get back. And summer, you would maybe get to take a week or two off, but. Um, it was just year round, just grinding. Any stitches in the face? No, no stitches. You are, listen to me. You are doing something right to hurt all your other joints and not your face. I don't know what you're <laughs> doing, but, but keep, keep it up for now. Hopefully we don't need a hip replacement before 40, but I know that, that I never amazing. like lost any of my teeth either. Cause some people will chip their teeth or they got beautiful yeah, teeth. Never broke my nose. Your ears. Yeah. You got a normal, I mean, good, good. listen, <laughs> you don't want to be all beat up and it sucks. Trust me. It's not fun. My, I got a deviated septum I and mean, it's the worst. You snore. Oh, man. It's terrible, but ears are all beat up, and you got you, you got something right. But the hip thing, the hip thing is, my dad had his hip replaced, and he needs his knee replaced. And he said, "The uh, here's the biggest thing I've heard from people, um, you know, all, all joint replacement people. I can't believe I waited as long as I did. Oh. That's the thing, uh, you know, over and over here. I can't believe I waited as long as I did. And the, a lot of the people I talk to, um." wait until they can't sleep. I think that's the big thing is when they can't get comfortable to sleep is when people start getting the joint replacements and you're at such a young age, they're going to try and push you off and be like, Hey, you know, we can only do so many of these. And they're going to try and push you off. You know that, right? Yeah. I actually tried. Um, I, uh, three years ago, um, <clears throat> I hurt my neck really, really bad. It was just from, you know, the years of being in the military and wrestling and whatever, We're um, where they We're were, we call that. Oh, wear and tear. Yeah, for sure. That's it. Um, where they were going to fuse my vertebrae together. And then um, finally, I just like got on a strict program and really started working on my neck. And I'm at the point where I almost need surgery, but I'm not going to yet. Can you do me a huge favor? Hmm. Don't wrestle live anymore. Yeah. Don't do that. I, I try not to. I, I limit my live interactions, but yeah. Cause that's when it all happens. You know what I mean? Like I think so much of it happens when people are like, ah, oh, no, I still got it, which we know you still got it. You can probably still go out and beat up most, most obviously all the high school girls, right. And you can compete with most of the high school guys, but 
man, they're, 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 they wrestle so hard. They're so strong. And a lot of them don't know what they're doing. And that's when you get hurt. I think when you're wrestling someone who doesn't yeah. know what they're doing. Yeah. I think <laughs> the girls like to, te- well, the guys do too. Um, when I coached at Mount Vernon, they would like to test me and like, is she really, does she really wrestle? Does she really know what she's doing? And let me put a whooping on them. <laughs> she doesn't look like it. She's not all beat up. Yeah. She's not all beat up. It doesn't look like someone whacked her in the face with a bat. Like the, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest thing I would say is, um, you know, you're in the military, right? How many yeah. years do you have in total, by the way? Do these years you're doing now count towards retirement years? Yeah. Yeah. So total years I have 12, but towards active, um, getting a 20 year active retirement, I have 10. So just over 10. So about nine years I'll be retiring. Will you, okay. I was just going to say, are you going to go career then? Will you go 20? I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Where are you now? Like, what is your, where where are you, um, as far as what's your rank now, right? Um, I'm a, I'm a master sergeant in E7. So you're E7 in the United States Army National Guard. Is that correct? Air National Guard. Now. Air National mm-hmm. Guard. Give me the difference between Army National Guard and Air National Guard. Army National Guard and, well, just Army and Air Force in general. Army, you're more boots on ground. And air, you're supporting the, like, airplanes and um, air missions. How many do you have in each? How many do you have in the Army? How many, how many do you have in the Air Force? Um, I have just over seven years in the army and then the rest have been, um, air. Oh, so almost five years in air. So they do jive though. Those, those yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have, jive. A, yeah, I didn't have a break break. It's military service in general. So. And if you can stay in Ohio, you obviously want to do that, but obviously we know how the military works. There's moving around. Well, with the national guard, the thing is you sign for the state. And so I'm actually signed with Ohio. And so I can move around within Ohio. But if I wanted to go outside the state, I would have to transfer to that state. But we take our we take our orders from the governor and then we also get them from the president. So, okay, so obviously the president can go over top of Mike DeWine, right? Yeah, yeah. He's the commander. Yeah, yeah. He's if he says we need X, Y, and Z airmen and troops, like where to report. And like so, these COVID missions that are kicking off in the hospitals, we from our base alone, and we have um, a bunch of people who are deployed and at different schools, and they activated. We're at like 180, and so we are just running ragged right now, um, getting people out the door last minute and trying to fill our own positions in our work centers. So. And you're mobilizing Crazy. from Mansfield, right? Like when you guys mobilize, they report to Mansfield, then go out, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that is that is a lot of logistics. Yeah, so it's a lot. What is your job? What is your job in the Ohio Air National Guard? What is your job? I pay people. <laughs> I work in finance, so um, I'm running everyone's uh, pays um, when they travel or um, they go in active on active tours or inactive mileage tours, mileage I'm per hanging. diem deployment pay uh whatever you got it because deployment pay is different than uh active duty pay right they're totally different right yeah yeah um they're about the same um you have different entitlements though and benefits but yeah it's the same but then your rank too your rank is a, correct yeah then you get see because i do i i teach a career class called career-based intervention and then I teach career exploration and we bring the United States Navy in. And, um, you know, they talk about the housing allowance. They talk about how the cost of living obviously is different in San Diego compared to what it is in Mansfield. Right. And he talks about what they get um, if they live on base and they go through mm-hmm. all of how your, all your medicals paid for. So all your surgeries have probably been paid for um, by the army, army and or air national guard, right? Like you have fabulous health insurance, some of the best benefits. And then you're in veterans affair VA, right? Yeah. So there's all that. And then you'll get that after at the end of your 20, you'll be in the veterans affairs is where you'll get your hips replaced. Hopefully not, not in the next nine <laughs> years. Right. But that's what you'll the next do. 20 right? surgeries I need. Yes. Next 20 <laughs> surgeries you need. You'll do that through veterans affairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so we bring them in and we talk about these types of things and, and kind of tr- tr- trying to prepare kids, you know, and do you have a four-year degree or do you have a master's degree? Like what, what degrees and what benefits have you gotten through, through the 
Army and Air National Guard? Yeah, so I've only actually taken a, a few semesters through the military. And so that's going to be kind of my goal in the next couple of years is work, really working on getting a bachelor's degree. But my thing is, you don't need one. Like, you really don't need one. If you're you, you really don't need it. And especially in this job market and where you are as an E7, I just don't think you need it. But if they're going to pay for it, why not, right? Why, why not? Right. Would you, would you agree mm -hmm. with that? No, 100% agree. If you could go back to 2004, 2005, what would you say to senior in high school, Vanessa, about wrestling, about joining the military? What would you say? Um, oh, I don't know, because my path that got me here got me here. So, and I'm doing pretty well. I, I think it would be one thing if I wasn't doing well, but I'm doing well for myself. And, um, but I kind of wish I would have focused more on um, going to school and um, going to a college to first start out, but it's been a, an amazing journey in itself and really forced myself to grow up and um, uh, did a lot of, a lot of bumps in the roads, but I, I'm here and I'm doing well. So the Ohio Coaches Association, you're on, you're, you're a, uh, what is your actual title in the Ohio Coaches Association? So in the Ohio High School Wrestling Coaches Association, I'm the girls' representative. Uh, I came on board uh, really uh, three years ago when we first started with the girls' state tournament, and then I became a board member um, in the past year. So talk about the process. You know, Dom, uh, Dom DeSabato really walked through it because he's a past president, and, you know, they do these, like, two-year cycles for different offices, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. And he cycled off, but, he, you know, he was – he, you know, he's talked about the girls state tournament and how excited he was about it and how fired up he got. I don't know if you got to watch the show, but the, the Sabados are unique individuals to say the least. Right. They're close, yes. um, but they're honest and they're, they're fighters. Right. And they, and they won't take no for an answer. And he's a pretty tenacious guy, but talk about the process for you, Vanessa, at least getting Ohio sanctioned and what your role was. Obviously we know you were a pioneer and just, a badass for lack of a better term right I mean you were rolling uh, you're you're the first real like high level girl I saw wrestle I remember oh, like, it was, like it was yesterday in Wade's gym right so besides that pioneering the sport as a competitor you know and then being a, a senior level athlete wrestling in WCAP what was the process like for you over the years to get it sanctioned in Ohio to have girls wrestling sanctioned yeah, so uh, when I first moved back, uh, I just started coaching at the high school, right? And um, I wanted to kind of get a feel for where we were at with girls wrestling. And it was, I think it was in um, 2009, no, 2008, or 18, geez, um, 2018, some of the parents had said there was going to be a vote with OHSA on girls wrestling. So I reached out to OHSA and said, hey, um, any feedback or any input that I can give into this, please let me know. And they emailed me back and was like, there's no vote. You have to go through the Coaches Association for any kind of sanctioning request. So I was like, Coaches Association? And I was like, I know the president, Don DeSabato. Like, he coached against me. I know him really well. And so I reached out to him, and I was like, hey, what can we do? And then that in 2019, in the spring, we met with um, some other coaches and parents uh, to really see about growing girls wrestling and the possibility of a girl state tournament. And that's when uh, it was announced in 2019 that there would be a 2020 uh, girl state tournament. Okay. What do you think the biggest obstacle was for you? Was there a person? Was there some old curmudgeon? old good old boy was there was it the ohsaa what was the biggest obstacle for you obviously when you just said it you're like oh the coaches association well yeah i know the sabato what was the obstacle for you that, that kind of once you're like oh once we get over this we're gonna get this done what's the obstacle that was kind of stuck out to you um so as soon as um that initial email that i had sent they had sent this packet and it was all this criteria that we needed to meet and it on there we met everything except for three years so right then that was the obstacle um 
solidifying those three years, like making sure we benchmark those three years. So that's what I said. That's my goal, three years. And that's my goal to get girls wrestling sanctioned. And so um, it wasn't a particular person. I think COVID didn't help. And then getting a new executive director and them just trying to keep sports alive in OHSA, um, that was pretty difficult. Uh, but, you know, they, they sat with us. They met with us. We were requesting meetings almost every month. Um, this past summer, every month they met with us and it was like more people from, um, OHSA would sit in on these meetings just because everyone wanted clarity on where we were at, how, what the logistics are, what's the financials. So, um, I wouldn't say a particular person. It was that packet, that three year packet or that three year, um, requirement that we were lacking on, but everything else we had it. So it really helped that we <clears throat> made sure that the girls were OHSA athletes. Um, when we met with them this past summer for the first time with Doug Ute, um, he didn't even realize that they were OHSA athletes, that that was our requirement. Wow. Um, so it, it was very, uh, it was a great meeting. And right from the get go, Doug Ute was um, all hands on board, wanting more and more information. From the start, Tyler Brooks has been a godsend. Like he has been, amazing we would not be where we were at if Tyler wasn't so supportive of girls wrestling we would say we need these rule changes he was on it he would email us that next day with the um, rule changes and what do we think when you think about it California and New Jersey were the two big ones for me right once mm -hmm. it, were you guys working in conjunction with those states were you communicating with other people in those states that had already sanctioned girls wrestling yeah, we've been um, working with a lot of different states and um, wrestling, wrestle like a girl because they are kind of like the hub for sanctioning girls wrestling. And so it was getting kind of their input. What were other states doing? And, um, you know, we kind of mirrored off of Michigan, off of California, kind of took what they did and see how it best fit with Ohio. Not, not that it's the right way to go, but um, we are we're trying, we're, we're putting plans in place and we're taking steps forward. You know, we might have to take a step back, but we're taking 20 steps forward every single time. I love it. When I heard about it, I was so fired up and then they did, they did boys volleyball, I believe. Right. Yes. Boys volleyball. They said we're, has been trying to get sanctioned for like 30 years. <laughs> Are you serious? Mm -hmm. How does that make like you feel when you hear that? How does it make you feel when you hear that? Okay, three years, it, thirty years. Okay, it like breaks my heart. It, I couldn't imagine doing what I am doing like the past three years for like thirty years. Oh you know, I remember God. back when um, I was in school, even in middle school, and I remember that we had boys volleyball, um, but I never realized it wasn't a sanctioned sport until I really started digging deep on um, this girls wrestling and trying to get it sanctioned. So, you know, ultimately your journey is completely different than anybody, uh, any, any young girls that are coming up now, middle school to girls, high school girls, they're having, they have a lot more opportunities, but you're a big part of it. You're the trailblazer, as I like to call you. You're a big trailblazer yeah, when you. it comes to girls uh, wrestling in the state of Ohio. What would you like to see girls get out of the sport of wrestling? You know, obviously it's, it's done so much for you. It took you to Colorado, took you uh, into the military, into the world-class athlete, athlete program. Uh, obviously you're coaching it now and you're such a huge advocate for it. What would you like to see girls get out of wrestling and the sport of wrestling? Like what, what compared maybe to your experience? Um, honestly, it's the brotherhood and sisterhood of it. Wherever I go, um, you know, you say you're a wrestler and you uh, instantly have that connection and that bond with someone. Um, I can tell you, I'm still best friends with um, all the teammates that I've had guys and girls. Uh, it's just, something you you don't get in other sports right? okay I'm that's what I, that's Go ahead. yeah that's that's like one of the biggest things like that, that i take away that and just how disciplined you are i went into the army and i was just like is this really like people think this is difficult like it was so easy compared to you know your day in day out of wrestling practices how old were you when you went to your first boot camp uh i had just turned 23 so it was probably really easy for you. Oh yeah, I was at the peak of my training. Uh, you're doing. And then I came out and I gained. Cog, cog climbs it was probably nothing for you. Oh yeah, I came out of um, once I did my school 
for the army. I came out and I gained 15 pounds. Really? Yeah, I, it was bad. <laughs> yeah. wow. How'd you feel? Um, I felt big for myself. Did you feel sluggish? I did, yeah, I just, it took me a while to get back into it. I felt very out of shape. You know, you go from sea level to Colorado, which is a high elevation, and <laughs> out of shape. <laughs> well, yeah. I, listen, anything in Colorado, you know, obviously the air is thinner, right? You're not getting as much oxygen to your blood. So it's yeah. like, it's harder to do stuff. You're winded easier. That Manitou oh, yeah. incline. Oh my God. Did you, it's, That was it's, our Saturday oh. morning workout for years. And it was really crappy then. They've redone it now and it's like oh, really yeah. nice, right? I don't know if you've been out there recently in the last couple of I years. Haven't, I haven't gone on it since they've redone it. Oh, I did, I'm like, I, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to. And then I'm like, eh, they, there's, there's the pleats on the steps. They count the steps every like 50 steps. I want to say, I'm like, it, this is like, yeah, this isn't what it was. I went on it when it was like washed out one time and all beat up and like bars sticking out and yeah. Stopped. And my wife tried to turn around and I like Jedi mind tricked her. We were going to visit Dustin Kilgore and I was like, She's because there's the dive out. There's like the halfway point where you can dive out and kind of wind down the mountain. And yeah. we got there and she's like, I was like probably 20 or 30 steps up, up from her. Right. And I was like, she's like, can you give me the car keys? And we had just driven from uh driven from uh Salt Lake city. So we were in the car for nine hours or whatever. Right. Oh my gosh. So we were going to the, the Olympic training center to see Kilgore and he lived with John reader. And I was like, all right, let me walk these keys back down to you. I'm sure Kelgore's not going to say a word to you about it. <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. That's it. I'm doing it. And they're like, it's all it took. All it took for <laughs> Kelgore to, uh, you know, mess with her and say mean stuff to her about how she's not tough enough to do it. And, you know, and that was it. And she snapped and we did it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I oh, had a... Um, Ohio buddy of mine. Um, I don't know if you remember the name, Tommy Cunningham. He wrestled for Groveport Madison. Um, the Groveport Madison, the Groveport Madison, where Mark Neiman's from, the Mighty Cruiser. Yes, I know who he is. So, anyways, he was a um, fighter pilot in the Air Force, and so um, he would call me up. He's like, "Hey, Ness, I'm coming into Colorado Springs tonight. We're doing flying missions. Can you meet up?" <laughs> yeah, we would meet up, and we would have a good old time. And then the always the next day he was like hey you want to go to do the incline no 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 it's my punishment no, i don't always, want to do that but we always did we always did oh mm -hmm. oh yeah i did it oh last time i did it dustin kilgore and i went over to give defense soap to linlin we went to linlin's house and linlin fed me like eight eight or nine uh ipas Oof. and i went and did the the uh the manitou incline mm. the next day and kilgore's like mm. dude you gotta go at like 5 a.m or you're not gonna find parking yep he wasn't wrong he wasn't wrong at all and somebody actually pulled out right as i was on my like third lap because you gotta drive up to it right and yeah the streets are lined and then the parking lot the last parking lot spot got taken and then somehow I found a spot. All the spots were filled up because now you got to shuttle to it. Did you yeah, know that? Yeah, you gotta, you yeah. You got to pay and you mm – -hmm. Yeah, it sucks. So I shuttled to it. I got the last spot at the shuttle, and I was up it. And, you know, of course, we had to have, like, uh, Taco John's or whatever it's called after Linlin fed me nine beers. It's not the optimal – it's not the optimal night before meal – for doing the incline i just if you don't know that i want you to know it now okay um yeah i just assumed that yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I probably was in that a, a time or two <laughs> you, you know what i'm talking about then it was horrible yes. like, oh my god yes. i'm 40 years old doing it too i'm like because you know it was two years ago and i was like oh my god what was i thinking and mm -hmm. it ended up being good that's a cool experience but i i know my wife will never do it again my wife was like, this is, cool. yeah. Cause you know, like, especially I'm still trying to build up the courage to do it again. Oh, uh, but like you did it so many times. You probably did it 
hundred times. I mean, why, you know, why, why, <laughs> why exactly? Why? I mean, you can see the great plains. Okay. Whatever. Cause that's all you can see <laughs> from that side of that view. You're looking out on the great right. plains. There's not even any mountains that you can really see. It's, it's, it's cause you're looking East. So, um, Oh, I just, I love talking old school stuff. rabbit holes. <laughs> it's like awesome. I love, I, it's like, it's, but what is your best memory from like living in the Springs? Because that place has changed a lot too, right? That's changed oh, yeah. a lot. What, what is your fondest memory of being out in Colorado and kind of being in that? Cause USA wrestling's uh, office headquarters are in the Springs. And then obviously the Olympic training center, it's different now because everything's COVID, right? When we talk about this, mm -hmm. everything's COVID. I don't think they got a lot. Of, they don't have anybody training on campus, really. And then they had that that uh, that U uh, eighteen. They were bringing juniors out and training them because it was Kevin Jackson's job. Now mm -hmm. there's not really anybody out there training because of COVID. What's your fondest memory of being out there? Uh, my fondest memory is um, we would wake up and we would do uh, runs on Saturday mornings, and so we would run. There was a memorial park it's like right down the way and i was always like one of the last ones because i'm horrible at running and um i really focus on running so this one time i ended up being we would run run to the lake and we would do two laps around the lake and then we would come back and one of the coaches um izzy he was just like are you finished? <laughs> I was like, that was the second one done. I was like, yes, I swear. I did. You shortcut it, didn't you? You sure yes. you cheated, didn't you, Oswald? Didn't you cheat? No, I I ran so hard. Like I really understood how to run at that point because before I didn't. <laughs> so I really got it. And then we would go to the pool and we would swim in the Olympic size pool. And um, oh man, that those were the days when it it just felt good. It felt good to train. Not that it felt good physically, but it just felt good to be able to train. Another one of my fondest memories was, um, it was before the 2006 world championships. And I was going as a training partner with Christy Davis at the, um, now Morano at the time. Um, she's like a nine time world medalist, but I went with her as her training partner and we were in the middle of training camp and they're like, Hey, we're going to go climb Pike's peak tomorrow. And we're like, okay and we, uh, we're not really thinking what we need to take or anything well mind you it's a 14 mile hike up the mountain and we started at 5 a.m and it's pitch black we're all layered up and we just start to go and it's like this almost dead sprint up the mountain and we did the switch back from the incline and so we did the switch back and we're just like drenched and it's freezing cold and um we had to stop a few times and nobody brought snacks nobody brought water and we get it up to the point where it's 10 miles and it's at the tree line yeah. and the where it's just line. rocks yeah yeah and um we get a call and they're like hey our ride can't go up the mountain because the wind is too heavy and it's shattering windshield so you can either get to the top and buy a train ticket down or you got to run back down and i'm like bring my wallet <laughs> like how am i gonna pay for a train ride so me and christy davis were like peace out so we just sprinted down the mountain another 10 miles back down <laughs> it was the craziest oh, oh my god yeah that was planning like one of the craziest your deal. hopefully your planning's your deal now is it, is it more your deal oh my gosh i am a planner <laughs> here's the problem oh. with that here's the problem with that um i had a school resource officer who sent me, he was at the school resource, school resource officer, like convention. I think it was in Reno. It was in Reno. So he went over and he hit Tahoe. Right. Well, this is okay. a guy who lives in like Willoughby or <laughs> East Lake or wherever he lives. Right. Yeah. And you know, he lives in the East Cleveland, essentially, right. The suburb of East, Cle East Cleveland suburbs. He did like this hidden waterfall and he's up in the Sierra Nevadas. Okay. You're an Olympic athlete, right? Like you're, yeah. you're, you're in the peak shape of your life. You're 20 something years old and you know, he's 45 years old or whatever. He didn't take any water. He didn't have hiking shoes. He had no gear. And this was like an mm. eight miler. You can't mess around. People don't understand. They, no. don't, respect. they don't respect. And in his defense, he just didn't know. You knew, 
you knew you were out in the springs, you were there, you knew the deal. You knew when you went up the mountains, you know, I mean, think about it. How often do they hear about hikers? Hikers up there, snowmobilers up there, skiers up there. Oh, they're in the back country. They got lost. Can't find them. Of course, they find a skeleton or they find a, you know, a dead person in the spring, right? Right? Yeah. That's how it works. Like, you got to respect it. You knew that. You knew that. To be fair, my school resource officer, he had no clue. He had no idea about water. I think he uh, eventually just, like, got to drink out of a waterfall or something. Oh my gosh. Could you imagine how messed up your stomach would be if you're drinking out of a water? Oh <laughs> yeah. The beaver, the, the Jardinia, the beaver fever that you get. Oh, it yeah. jacks you up. but you know what? It's either that or die from dehydration. Cause it'll kill you. Yeah. I just don't be, people just don't respect. They don't. And like, think about that. Just think about what, why they couldn't come get you. The shattering windshields. So that means yeah. it's carrying little probably quarter sized pieces of rock throwing them into the window at 50, 60, 70 mile an hour. Like terrifying. That's terrifying to most people. I'm glad you were, you, you didn't even know better and that's good. Yeah. I, I was better. like, no, not doing it. And, and there was like snow at the top and like, I don't know why none of us thought about any of this. Uh, now we know. Now you we know. Young 20 and that's Ter- why. Terry's, Terry Steiner was like, come on, let's just go to the top. I'm like, I don't have snowshoes on. Like you have to go through snow. I'm like, I'm out. I need, and it was like, you know, 30 some degrees at the top and then 90 degrees at the um, bottom. So we're like, we're cold. We're getting out of here. So we just like booked it back down the mountain. It took us like maybe an hour to get back down, but it took us like, you know, five hours to get 10 miles up. I, and I'm just going to tell you this as a fat person, as a 250 pound man, Right. And I've done all this stuff at 250, 245. Right. Done all this stuff at like as a big guy. Right. I don't mind going up. I hate going down. I hate it. It hurts my, yeah, my ankles, ankles hurt. my ankles, my knees, and my hips. Um, I did one in Rocky Mountain National Park, that East Inlet. We did Lone Pine Lake, did a couple other ones. And they ended up being like 14, 15 milers. Right. And we left from like Grand Lake. Right. So, um, we went up and I had my buddy Sean Wentz with me and he was one of my college teammates. He's a Kent, he's from Kent, Ohio actually. And he uh, was complaining the whole time. I'm like, Sean, he's a mer- ex Marine. I was so verbally abusive to Sean Wentz about it. And I did. And here's the other thing. I lied. I was like, Oh, it's like six miles up, five miles up. It's not, <laughs> you only gain like three or 4,000 feet. Not a big deal. It ended up being by the end of it a five thousand, a five thousand feet uh, uh, elevation gain. Ended up being about a sixteen miler because we went past Lone Pine Lake. Oh my gosh! And it, like knowingly, I'm telling you, I'm admitting that I was lying to him. And his biggest thing was, and here's this is bad on me. He'd had open heart surgery, and he'd never done any like major cardio since. So now you think I'm a bad person. Now I'm a bad guy. Now Vanessa's going to hang up. She's going to hang up. She's done. This is over. This podcast is over. Barbara, no, I'm just going to. do it anymore. Zeb's trying to murder his friends on the mountain. Yeah, and anytime if we do a hike together, I'm definitely going to research that hike before we do First it. First off, you're in amazing shape, and you're not going to have any problem hiking with me. Let's just get that out of the way. And Sean, here's the thing about it. Sean, he owned his own CrossFit gym in Longmont. Yeah, he owned his own CrossFit gym in Longmont, and he owns a, a he owns a, a nonprofit called Warrior Saber, and they do uh, their big thing is how veterans acclimate back to regular society. That's they're they're recognizing how active and reserve members and all branches acclimate back to being productive individuals because that that's a big thing with veterans. I don't I don't think we uh, yeah. Treat our Going veterans, back to civilian really. world. Mm-hmm. It's really hard. It's a hard transition for, um, for people who've deployed and, and, um, people. My girls that I coach, they tell me I'm like a drill sergeant on them all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, that's what your deal is though. It's kind of like what you're, yeah. you've been indoctrinated in that for, for, I mean, you're 12 years into it. Reti- I mean, 10 years into it retirement, but 12 years actually, right? Yeah. 12 I mean, years total. Yeah, 12 years total, but 10 years retirement. Can you try and find those two years? Can you kind of kind of try and finagle those or something? Uh, no. 
No, no. that's how it is. It's in the books, no. huh? No. Yeah. I got about nine years till I retire. I'm good with that. Good for you. You'll probably buy a business or do something or do finance or have an MBA by then and be the CEO of a company, hopefully. No, my goal is to be the study hall monitor at Ontangy Orange, and then I can yell at the kids, <laughs> and then in the summer I'll go up to the lake. <laughs> yeah, hey, do, I saw that. Do you guys got a place in Lakeside or Danbury? Where is it? Um, Lakeside Marblehead, right beside yeah, East Yeah, Harbor by State Danbury. Park. Yeah, I know where it is. I'm from Ottawa County. Yeah. Oak yeah, Harbor. there you go. Oak Harbor's the next town, uh, two towns over. Yeah, it is. No, I was from That's Oak Harbor, very- Ohio. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. So Oak Harbor, and actually, where you're, is that your parents' house or your place? I have a place, and then my parents are right across the street from me. So you have two places. You have two houses. Well, I have like a little cabin, and then my parents have, they have a trailer, and their trailer is like literally probably 50 feet from my front porch. You're literally downplaying what I just asked you. You have the house that you live in right there in Mount Vernon. And you have a house at Lakeside, Marblehead Lakeside. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. That you gave me like a lawyer answer. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> no, it's a cabin, not really. It's a house. It's a dome. It's, it's just it's, it's just a little cabin. I just rent it. Okay. And okay. I got a little a little cruise around on my golf cart. I'm cool in the summer. Well, it sounds like a good time. Yeah, because. It's fun there, but it's really fun when you're 20 something fun. And I think it's fun again then when you, you're like, get old like me. So you're in, a, do you go to Put in Bay at all? Um, I, I went once last year, maybe once a year I go, but not really. Like, my thing is we stay in the park because it's like, I'm the young one in the park and like everyone is retired. And yeah. uh, I just have a good time with everyone. La- this past, this past year, summer, we um, organized a uh, summer or beer Olympics. Oh, huh. it was so funny to watch like 70 year old people chug some beer uh, and then do, do silly things. Right. Yeah. It was if it's fun. The beer Olympics. <laughs> I know how that, what that entails. Ridiculous games that test your balance when you're drunk. Okay. I got it. Okay. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> ultimately, right. You're, you're, you have a fabulous, you've built a really good situation for yourself in Ohio. Right. Right. Yeah. Vanessa, like, what do you think ultimately your legacy is going to be? I hope it's what you said. I want your goal for you, right? I want your goal for you. I want you to be the study hall monitor and I want you to be the girls head coach at, <laughs> at Orange, right? Somebody's going to watch this and be like, yeah, we got to snag her up. We could, we could definitely do the study hall thing for her. But ultimately, <laughs> what, do you th- what do you think your legacy is going to be in the sport of wrestling and, and you know, helping implement and getting it sanctioned in the OHSAA? And what you've done for the sport of wrestling in the state of Ohio, what do you think ultimately your legacy is going to be? Oh man, my legacy. That's a good question. Um, I just hope my legacy is um, that people can look back and just say, like, I had a passion that um, I really, what I really want and what uh, really happened was that we increased the girls' growth. We provided more opportunities and equal opportunities for these young ladies. I want what's better for the girls now than what I had. Um, So that's been my biggest goal. And I hope that's the legacy I can leave behind that um, having better now than what one used to have. I don't know. It's it's already, you're already there. You're already there compared to what your experience was. You're light years ahead of, of what your experience was, you know, lat whipping and lat dropping and, headlocking people at the, you know, at the weight tournament, right? Like yeah, your, 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 your leaps and bounds ahead of that, as far as the opportunities, as far as, as far as the participation, you said there were six mm-hmm. schools that had college wrestling, right? Six women's yeah. programs. What it's over oh, yeah. 50 now, isn't it? Oh, it's um, over a hundred. If I'm not mistaken, I yeah, know I last mean, year it was like 80. Yeah. Um, Look at that. But yeah, Look, just think about that. Just think about those numbers. Like, Obviously, I'm completely wrong when I say 50, but 50s 10 times the programs that it had when you were in high school. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, if- and, and, and I want our state to be able to fill those um, slots at, at those um, 
scholarships at these different colleges because right now they're struggling because all the states aren't sanctioned. So they have all these colleges that are building these programs, but they don't have girls to fill those positions. So it's like, that's what we need to do. We need to provide these opportunities, get these girls um, a state tournament, have that opportunity for them. Um, so that's kind of been our push. And um, I just want girls to be able to have confidence when they wrestle. And it's hard to when you're just getting beat on by the opposite sex. So that's, I just want these girls to, and our girls, like they didn't really understand the magnitude of sanctioning the other day because all they've known is what we've provided. And that's them wrestling girls. They really didn't, it wasn't a concept that girls wrestling wasn't sanctioned. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's wild. When you say it, when you put it like that, they didn't even, they didn't even know that they weren't a sanctioned OHSA sport. They thought because you'd provided them with so many opportunities to wrestle other girls that it was just a thing. They just thought it was a thing, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, will you give me a breakdown of the, what they're doing this year for the postseason? for girls wrestling in the state of Ohio, because you do have a couple, you have a qualification tournament and a state tournament. Is that correct? Yeah. So we have four districts. We've broken down by County kind of trying to um, spread it out by the number of girls in that County. So it's split into four districts and then um, the top four will advance to the state tournament. So then we'll have um, a 16 person bracket at the state tournament. Um, state tournament will be the um, Saturday and Sunday. So I want to say the district that he couldn't remember last week was Lutheran West. Yeah. Lutheran right. West, Marysville. Um, My guy, Sean Andrews. Yep. Um, Harrison and then Olin Tangy Orange. Olin Tangy Orange. Okay. So mm -hmm. that, that's awesome. And you know, that's an opportunity. I like that they do the, uh, the corners at least. I like that Cincinnati has one and I like that Cleveland has one. We're at our hour. Do you got a little overtime for me? You got a little bit of overtime? <laughs> yeah. I might. Um, do you mind if I unplug my headphones so I can charge you do my you. phone? You do you. Give me a little bit of overtime, though, okay? Yeah. Can you still hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Just fine. Okay. But I like that they're able to go corner to corner, Robert, obviously, in the big population centers. And then we already talked about it. Um, you know, Columbus is exploding, right? Yeah. They're, uh, they're exploding and having two districts within striking districts distance there. And with the growth of girls wrestling in the central Ohio area, that's huge. Toledo people are going to have to travel and the people in, down in the Athens area are always going to have to travel because they're just never going to have district and regional stuff there because it, the population doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't call for it. And that's just, those are simple. That's simple logistics with that. Right. Yeah. So I'm glad that they, they, they were able to get it in the, the, the strongholds in the population areas where you're going to get more opportunities for more people to travel less. Right. Yeah. Do we know where the OHSA state girls tournament will be? Will it be at Cavelli? Will it be at Schottenstein? Do we know any of those specifics yet for 2023? No, it's still trying to be figured out right now. Um, and I don't even know if um, I'll be in those conversations really, but what had been discussed is um, possibly keeping it separate for, um, from the boys, this um, shot and scene, they have it down, you know, minute by minute, what match is where um, it also puts a strain on coaches um, right now. You know, if they have the girls and the boys competing at the same time, they're going to be, you know, running all over the place. So, um, I like the idea of keeping it separate right now. That's just me, but, um, we're all entitled to our opinions, right? Because we're really able to showcase the girls. Um, we want them to have, like, I want them to have a magical moment. So I think, um, hopefully we can get in the Cabelli center. I think that would be pretty uh, awesome. Tom Ryan and Ohio state wrestling has just been the greatest advocates and supporters for us. Um, you know, we ask, Hey, can we have, a practice in your room and they're like come on in or you know we ask for a um, dual meet before their match and you know he makes that happen so they've been a pretty great advocate and he said you know why don't you guys get the girls state tournament here we can try and find some donors or something you know so come on Tom. <laughs> Coach Ryan is definitely always ahead of the curve on everything right like he's always real forward thinking guy um, his big thing, I, I remember the, the uniform things is, is the thing that sticks out to me about Tom Ryan. Remember the rash guard and the shorts? 
Oh, yeah. That was a big Tom Ryan thing. And Hofstra, when he was at Hofstra, they were the first ones to wear that, if, I, if I'm recalling it right. So, like, and I understand yeah, a uniform is obviously different than adding a whole division and adding 50% of the population now has the opportunity to wrestle in a girls' state tournament, right? Um, that's obviously different. But my point is he's super forward thinking when it comes to this stuff. He, like, he gets promotion. He gets opportunities. Because, you know, when you have the rash guard and the shorts, kids who didn't want to wear a singlet, now will come out and wear rash guards and the shorts and go out and wrestle. Right. So yeah. I thought that was super smart on him and it was like kind of a marketing thing. And I'm just not the huge singlet person, right? Like the shorts and the t-shirt, I think it's what you're practicing on all the time. You know, not all the time are guys in, in singlets and they do for simulation days and stuff like that. And more, you'll see more of it, but I'm a shorts and t-shirt guy when it comes to that. I'm not going to lie to you, but I get it. And I'm glad that he's supportive of you like that. Um, so we don't know what that's going to look like. We don't know if they're going to do divisions, right? We don't even know if it's going to be. Yeah. We don't even know that. Yeah. So I don't know how they're going to um, break this out. Um, I think the, because right now um, it's sanctioned, right? It's classified as emerging. Um, and that emerging status just gives the OHSA the flexibility to constantly being able to uh, make changes for improvements. Uh, so that's what that classification is. And a lot of girls uh, were posting, oh my gosh, I can't wrestle the boys anymore. My wrestling career is over. And it's not about, you know, taking away opportunities. It's about increasing opportunities for girls. So sanctioning, you know, increasing that opportunity, not taking away, especially from small schools as well, or schools where you only have a, a female on the team. Um, you know, there's talks of, you know, a girl having to pick a postseason. Um, kind of like um, golf, where the girl can um, choose whether she does the girls or the boys side. So kind of being flexible with that, but still having guidelines and starting to build on that and, and what that looks like. Is it going to be um, sectionals next year or is it going to be divisions? Uh, how, how we break that out or how OHSA breaks out, I should say. Um, more to come. I'm just pumped. I'm pumped about the opportunities. I'm pumped that more people can be involved in the great sport of wrestling. I'm pumped that people don't have to get crushed by a dude and get their shoulder blown out or their knee blown out. Right. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Like you're saying, there's always guys are always trying to hurt you. It, it happened quite frequently more than it should have. Um, uh, so that's why I just don't, because so many of these girls, after wrestling the boys for so long, you know, they're having to have shoulder surgery or whatever. Um, there's no reason why we should have to go head to head against a guy, especially the girls that are like 170. Come on. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unfair, like you're saying. And I'm glad you're an advocate of, and that you really, you know, you experienced it. You know, you know what that's like to have a dude trying, I felt to, it. <laughs> yeah. trying to murder you, right? Like trying to blow your shoulder out or, you know, break your neck. It's not cool. It's not okay, yeah. right? So I think yeah, that, exactly. that I think that that will draw more people, right? I mean, because there's always that anxiety, right? There's anxiety both ways, though. That's the thing. It's not just the girl yeah. who has the anxiety about wrestling a guy who's much stronger than her. It's both ways. You understand that, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's what like COVID it kicked off, and this guy um, they were going down. I don't know their rabbit holes of past times and he messaged me and told me like I'm the reason for his depression and this and that because he had to wrestle a girl and like yeah it's a no win for you I, like I, yeah I wanted the opportunity to wrestle though too you know like <laughs> wow wow that went really that happened yeah I'm sorry to hear that but you know what I mean that that's that's and he got we... pretty aggressive with me he like was swearing at me and I'm like I'm I'm trying to grow girls wrestling to make it to where they don't have to wrestle the boys. I, I don't know what you want yeah. me to do, man. That wow, wow! And you're chill too. You're pretty chill, I guess. You know, obviously, when it gets into like a combative situation, and you're fired up, yeah, right. Things can change, but yeah, for the most part, you're approachable. You're a nice person. You obviously care about kids. I mean, wow, you're not you're not the person I'd be coming at. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you, I, like. You're not the bullseye, whether you kicked my butt in high school or not. Um, you're not it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, like just, okay. I'm like, well, I, I'm hoping to provide an opportunity for your daughter then, bud. There you go. Uh, we have some really good young talent. I think, obviously, we talked about Olivia Shore. She's really good. I think she's someone that you'll see 
on future new U.S. national teams. I think she's that good. Layla Castro, she graduated a few years ago. Stud. Okay. Taryn Martin, stud. Grace Jones. These girls, like, as the years go on, like, so as we build, and right now we have studs coming through as well. As the years build on, the girls' talent is just going to continuously get better, just like at the senior level, you know. Um, the team that we have now, the best team we've ever had. But it's it's because it's been building, yeah. you know. It's just going to get better. Yeah, like Lyric Hetzer, though. Total showstopper. Big time. Um, she does like a Torella cross body ride, like a, like a Shalas cradle, a splatle from top. She'll take the boys down. And then she will throw a boot in and she splatles them like a shallow's cradle, uh, like a Chirella cross body. And like none, none of them, it's just like, boom, she hits it so quick. She just won Tulsa that flow wrestling did a feature on her. She's the real deal. And like, obviously we've known about her for years, right? Cause she's really good. Yeah. I mean, the future is really bright. Uh, I, the one that you didn't even know, Talia Guntram. When you see Talia Guntram, you're going to be like, okay, she's the real deal. She's the real deal. And I think she's like a person that could be all state in a, like four sports. So, you know, we're, we're going to see if there's that opportunity, right? Like, can they do multiple yeah. sports? Right. And if she goes to a small school, maybe, but you know, that's so far in the future. It's hard to say, but. Chloe Deerwester is going to be Chloe a one to is, watch out for. She's the chin whipper. This year. She's the chin whipper, right? Yeah. She'll chin whip. Yeah. I'm just going to, Hey, um, listen, if you want the. She's, Josie Davis she's, is a chin whipper too. Yeah. Um, Chloe Deerwester is a junkyard dog. Harrison. Harrison. Is she a sophomore? Yes. She's really good. She's she really is good. so tough. Yeah. I saw her come out. Of, um, I, her parents had posted a picture coming out of wrestling one of her matches and her eyes just like busted up like Sarah Hildebrandt where it's just like blood everywhere. And I'm like, gosh. So crazy. Yeah. And like you're saying, the level of talent and their technique and their skill and their ability and how they can jump out. It's pretty incredible. Um, yeah. We could see these, her those be girls a D1. Have just been, what, these girls um, that we've been mentioning, I mean, they've just been grinding at it. Like they have just, um, cause I came onto the scene and they were just um, touch top notch national rank girls. Um, so it's exciting to see them uh, excel in their, you know, college careers and um, or the young girls coming up and, and seeing our girls on our team, like looking up to these girls, uh, it's pretty cool. It's awesome. We got to get some uh, old school Vanessa Oswald high school uh, videos. We got to find some of those. Can we dig some of those up? No, let's not no, do that. we're not getting any of them. <laughs> you probably have Flow wrestling videos though, don't you? From senior level. No, Flow was like not a thing back then. No, oh nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We were, well, when I was with them. True. Right. Yeah, I bet you. That was we when they find, were just coming on board. Yeah, but I bet you we could find the year you were second was in Omaha, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? I wrestled Elena Bruskova in the uh, finals. I bet you I called the match. I'm gonna find mm. it now, and I'm gonna send you the link. Yeah. Well, let's not what. Let's not rehash that. And, and it was a best <laughs> two out of three, too, wasn't it? Um, I think it went only two matches. But it was a it was a still Listen, a best two out of three. Too many concussions. Too many concussions. I can't remember. Okay, if I find the video, I'm going to shoot you the link. So, all right. Oh Lord. Do you have out? Listen, I'm not going to blast it out there and make sure. Hey, look at Vanessa lose two matches straight to Prasikova. Come on, <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you. Do you have anything else for me, Vanessa? No, I just appreciate uh, you having me on and just talking girls wrestling and uh, really putting girls wrestling out there. So much appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you. Get everything that needs fixed. Hips, knees, anything. Get, it, get that stuff fixed if you can. Yeah. You're going to rock it till the wheels fall off. I know you are. You're just too tough for your own good. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Hey, stick around for a little bit. Uh, go uh, go check out www.barbarianapparel.com. Got singlets. We got Barbarian Hour. We got some new Barbarian Hour artwork coming. I'm going to share that with Vanessa uh, when we cut off here. It's pretty funny. It's uh, some Jared Opfer Zeb Miller artwork. Uh, you can, we can both have a good laugh to start out with the first design. 
Vanessa Oswald, thank you for being a pioneer of girls wrestling in the state of Ohio. Stick around. Thank you.